pause here to video for just a minute. I think we'll have to cut away from this. I'm talking about living without anger and uh, how death to self enables us to be persons of peace. And I had gotten a fair bit into a video and then these dogs kept barking and I was getting so angry at the dogs. It was like, that's what dogs do. So I went away to another place and I found this great place to, walk, to tape this where there's turkeys. I don't know if you can see them behind me, but there are a bunch of wild turkeys. And um, just because it was fun, I thought, I'm going to tape here. Um, and then another dog started to bark. So I may need to stop this any second, but you might be able to watch these turkeys. We're learning together about uh, how to live in denial of self so that we can become a different kind of person. And we talked last time about vanity. How is that going? Paul wrote to the church at Corinth uh, that for this reason we don't lose heart, that I would leave her wasting away. That's called aging. And that's going on all the time, every day. I experience it. Listen to a talk by Dallas Willard the other night where he said, nobody goes to a plastic surgeon to have something lowered. Um, everything is drooping. Everything is lowering. That's the way it goes. But inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. And that is a real possibility for us if we're willing to do one thing. And that is to not live for ourselves, not think about ourselves. When we die to ourselves, that lesser, uh, superficial self, then a nobler, greater self can be born within us. And that leads me to the end of this chapter. I'm on page 74 now as we're thinking about death to self. And this is so important. Dallas writes, standing about standing for the right without egotism. This is about how you can become a person of peace in an age of outrage, but a dog is barking. So I'm going to pick this up again in another place where I can do it calmly and with no irritation in my spirit. Same topic, different setting, no turkeys. Page 74, Dallas writes about standing for the right without egotism. One of the real sources of difficulty here is confusion of our desire for what is good and right to prevail, that's a good thing, with our desire to have our own way. One often sees the effects of this confusion in controversies, in families, in churches, or between religious and political groups. Confusion of the desire for what is good and right to prevail, that's good, versus get my own way. In such cases, very important values are often at stake. People are passionately committed to one side or another. That is as it should be. But more often than not, the contempt and anger for others that emerges in the conflict is nothing but a manifestation of the will to have my way. And folks, this is our day. Families, churches, communities, and sovereign nations become embroiled in deadly conflicts that would immediately disappear or be resolvable, but for the relentless will to have my way. A significant part of the business of police courts and hospitals is the result of the drive of mere self-will and has no genuine bearing on the good of individuals, much less on the glory of God. Now, this is part of why self-denial and anger are so closely connected with each other. Anger is the energy that I feel when my will gets frustrated. I want to straighten out whatever it is, resolve whatever it is that is frustrating my will. Very often that involves another person. And so then anger moves very quickly to will to harm. And it's a very dangerous thing to cultivate anger. Michael Ware was talking about this not long ago. There are people who believe that a social conscience or political involvement requires will to anger, will to harm. 
And Jesus would stand on another side of that. Martin Luther King, the insistence that we love all, including the people who regard themselves as our enemies, is central. One of the people that I was reading this week who writes about the emotion of anger talks about part of what happens when you get angry is it inflates the sense of importance of your goals and your agenda, and it deflates the sense of the importance of the other person's. This writer says, actually, one of the best things to do when you're really, really angry is what he calls the walk-away strategy. Not as a way of trying to be passive-aggressive or control the other person, just simply to walk away and allow the anger to dissipate, to breathe deeply, to take a walk. And what you will discover if you run this experiment, the walk-away strategy, is when you come back to the situation without the hot, energy of anger, it will look different. And I will have more empathy and understanding towards the other person. See, because anger is the frustration at my will being frustrated, there is a way in which it is just deeply conflicted with dying to my will, at least insofar as it's just about me wanting to have my own way. Dallas goes on, beyond anger, retaliation, and unforgiveness, To accept with confidence in God that I do not immediately have to have my way releases me from the great pressure that anger, unforgiveness, and the need to retaliate imposes upon my life. This is by itself a huge transformation of the landscape of our life. It removes the root and source of by far the greater part of human evil we have to deal with in the world. Paul directed the Christians in Thessalonica to, quote, see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but all we seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.15, Thessalonians. Jesus commanded not to resist him who is evil, But whoever slaps on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. Peter calls us to follow Jesus in not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. As I had heard a wonderful sermon last weekend from Steve Clifford, and he talks about, I think Tim Keller mentioned this, five marks of the early church. Uh, it was remarkably diverse, multi-ethnic. It was in Antioch, people were first called Christians because it was getting so diverse it couldn't be regarded just as a Jewish sect anymore. And there was radical generosity for the poor, unlike any other move in the ancient world. And there was a spirit of non-retaliation, non-violence, forgiveness. And there was a deep care for infants, for unprotected lives that in the ancient world were often considered discardable. And then there was a much higher kind of strict uh, commitment in terms of sexual practice to monogamy and chastity. And he talked about how in our day, if you look at the political divide, uh, those first two practices, diversity, multi-ethnicity, and then generosity of the poor, tend to be associated with progressive politics, the Democrat Party. And the last two, care for the unborn, the infant, and high regard for sexual purity are associated with conservatives and the Republican Party. But the church was known for all of them. And then the middle one, a non-retaliatory spirit of forgiveness, understanding, compassion, love for the enemy. Who's practicing that? Nobody is. In political discourse in our day, cable channels, uh, like it's built on wanting to demean the other. So, Our world, our society desperately needs you to become a person of peace in an age of outrage. Dallas goes on. These remarkable teachings and examples, which do so much to immediately transform life, all presuppose that one has laid down the burden of having one's own way. You can't begin to even understand them, much less follow them, except from a posture of self-denial firmly supported upon confidence. And this based in turn a strong experience of God's all-sufficient presence in your life. I struggle with this. I've told you I I experience more uh, anguish over anger and resentment at this point in my life than I ever have before. And there are two practices that really help me. 
One of them is to be deeply in touch with my own fallenness, my own brokenness, my own sins, because it's much harder to be judgmental and self-righteous towards others, which anger demands, when I'm aware of how broken I am. It's very interesting. The prophets uh, who spoke with great indignation and passion about what was going wrong, every single prophet also has a confession of sin where they identify with the sinfulness of their people, except one. Isaiah, for example, says, Woe is me, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people. Who's the one prophet that does not ever identify with the sinfulness of his people? And the answer is Jonah. Who's the one prophet that's got the biggest problem with anger? Jonah. He goes to preach at Nineveh, the world's worst sermon of all time. His whole sermon is just, uh, in 40 days, God will overthrow Nineveh. And amazingly, people respond to the worst sermon of all time. And they repent, and God doesn't destroy them. Jonah builds a little shelter to see what's going to happen to the city. He's hoping that it will be destroyed. And when it's not, he's angry. And God asks him, Jonah 4.4, 4, have you any right to be angry? Jonah does not answer. And so God causes a little vine to grow to shade Jonah. And he loves that vine. And then God sends a little worm to eat away the vine. And then a hot, scorching east wind. And Jonah is furious about this. And God asks him again, have you any right to be angry this time about the plant? And Jonah says, I do. And, and God says, well, if you care about that, uh, should I not care for my people? So when I become aware of uh, my own sinfulness and confess it, it helps me avoid that kind of Jonah anger. And then the other practice is to be aware of the way that the people I'm angry at have also been hurt, have also been wounded, to develop compassion for them because everybody is this mixture. And when I die to myself, I'm able to see that more clearly. Now we're going to go on to here to look at what are the indispensable elements in, by which we begin to move towards restoration of good in the soul. But that's for next time. See you then. Hey, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell so you never miss an episode. There are emails that go along with each video. If you'd like to receive those, you can let us know at becomenew.me slash subscribe.